Please grab your notebooks and get ready to have your mind blown because we've got a very special guest in the house today. It is the one and only Derek Sivers. He's a writer, author, a visionary entrepreneur and a sought after speaker who has helped countless people turn their ideas into action. The ones that I'd say people would say were the biggest uh, was when I sold my company for $22 million. If you don't know the next step, you can't really take a step. It doesn't matter that most people do this and more people do that. What matters is that you don't have to. Reflecting is where I've learned everything. Sometimes we just get an instinctual gut feeling of like, ooh, this is what I want, yes. Not that I'm trying to be unconventional. <laughs> yeah, I like that. My dear listeners, please grab your notebooks and get ready to have your mind blown because we've got a very special guest in the house today. It is the one and only Derek Sivers. Derek is one of my all-time favorite thinkers. He's a writer, author, a visionary entrepreneur and a sought after speaker who has helped countless people turn their ideas into action. He's the mastermind behind the wildly successful online platform CD Baby, which has revolutionized the music industry and helped independent artists reach new heights. And now he's here to share his wisdom with us and hopefully continue to inspire us to chase our dreams, no matter how big or small. He is most definitely my kind of person, and I know he will be your kind of person too. Welcome to the podcast, Derek Sivers. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I like the idea of like, as you're saying that I can tell it's written and I'm imagining going back and saying, hmm, how about instead of share your wisdom, we write shoot the shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can edit that in for sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast, Derek. Uh, it's been a while Thanks, in man. the making and I can confirm it's worth the wait. And also it was probably the most interesting email i've ever sent to a guest in terms of invite <laughs> yes can <laughs> i, I tell the story about reading it yeah please do <laughs> okay so audience um i get many emails that say uh like hello my name is tracy i am the assistant for such and such famous podcaster who would like you to come on the show uh could you please let me know your availabilities and when i get an email like that i'm kind of like eh Hi, Tracy. Thank you for the email. Sorry, I'm very busy. Take care. <laughs> okay, so then there's the next level, which is like, hi, my name is such and such, and I have this podcast. Um, would you please consider being a guest on my show? Please let me know your availabilities. And again, if that's all they say, then I'm like, eh, you know, I, I'm busy. Sorry, I just can't. Okay, so then I get this email one day. And please understand, I get like 100 emails a day. But this one from your lovely Meg, was just like, hi, Derek, enter, enter. I don't drink, enter, enter. I don't smoke, enter, enter. <laughs> uh, but I love, but I no, I'm not addicted to anything, enter, enter, <laughs> except people, enter, <laughs> enter. I love people, enter, enter. <laughs> like, and it was like spaced out like this. And it was just, it exuded so much personality that at first I'm just riveted, like, what? the fuck and then at the bottom of this long amazing colorful exuding personality email it says and i have a podcast and i would love for you to come on my podcast and i was like oh fuck yeah look, i don't even need to look at your stats i don't need to look at how many listeners or how many stars with an invitation like that i'm in so that oh, is your host. Thank Meg. you. That means the world. I think you literally sell back like one line. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all I need to say. I was like, damn right, I'm in. Yeah. Count me in. Here's, you know, you're great. Thank you. No, that really means a lot. And uh, I was I was saying to you, like, um, that was like the first email where I really thought, you know what? I'm I'm messaging Derek Sivers. He's probably never gonna come on the podcast. And like, so <laughs> I'm gonna write an email that I really want to write to Derek Sivers. I've got nothing to lose. And yes, yeah, so thank you for um, 
given me the confidence that I did that because, um, it, yeah, I, I was so excited. I was running around the house. The fact that you even replied, let alone <laughs> to get such a powerful sentence back. So, yes, yeah, so excited to talk to you today. So thank you very, very much. Equally excited to talk with you. And the reason I was so excited is because you've been a huge mentor of mine, obviously indirectly because <laughs> you only learned about my existence from that email. Um, but I've been looking forward to connecting with you and giving the listeners a little bit of insight into your brain, because I love your brain. <laughs> I really, really do. Um, I, somehow you manage to be like assertive yet comforting, like your words, are like kind of like a warm hug. Um, and mm. yet also you are to the point but take us on such a beautiful journey with your words as well. So, so excited to have this conversation today. And if you wouldn't mind, I would love to share a little bit of insight into how I first crossed paths with you indirectly. Yes, please. Uh, Because yeah, I think it's a little sweet backstory. So I'm going to take everyone back to 2015. I was an adventurous 22-year-old. Um, just shy of a year out of university. And it was my first ever day as a California summer camp counselor. And I'd been waiting to go on this adventure for almost a year, probably nearly about three years. Um, but that's a story for another day. Uh, so anyway, it's my first day of camp. And I've gone through the gates. I've got this nice, warm, fuzzy feeling when I entered. And the first week was no kids there because we're just doing a um, like a counselor training week. And the first time I ever met my camp founder was him walking through the back doors of the dining hall to the circle of life from the Lion King holding his child up. And I was my tears of laughter told me, do you know what? I'm going to have fun this summer. But the thing that really struck me from that first day was something that my camp director, Nick, had said. And what he was saying was that in life, if we're lucky, we're going to have a number of what he called click moments, these full body homecoming moments where you find yourself in the present moment and something just clicks and you think exactly where I am now is where I'm meant to be. But the thing is, he said that you can't force a click moment. So some people have a click as soon as they like enter the camp gates. So that's wonderful. For some of you, it might take a few days or even maybe the whole summer. And some of you won't feel that click moment at all. And that's okay. But you can't force a click moment, but you can be open to one. And you could also be the reason it clicks for someone else. And I just, that really moved me and it resonated with me in such a strong way. And it still still does now. And the thing was, I I felt warm going through the gates. I knew I was going to have a fun summer, especially after the circle of life. And I was open to a click moment, but I don't think I felt it yet. So if we fast forward to a few days later, we are in our big training room. And the camp directors are doing a presentation on the camp culture and what basically they want us to help them achieve that summer. And they said that we can't really show you, sorry, we can't really tell you in words what our culture is, but we want to show you. So they showed us a three minute clip that changed my life. And it was called <laughs> How to Start a Movement by uh, Derek Sibbers. <laughs> and the click had never been so loud. I watched that clip and I remember looking around the room at my peers and what we were all hoping to achieve that summer. And it felt like coming home. So I just wanted to say thank you for being my Aww. click moment. I did not know where that story was going. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was not it could have gone that. all sorts of ways. Um, <laughs> well, so, yeah, I lived you. in Los Angeles for many years, so I thought you were going to mention like, and uh, you met a dear friend of mine or something mm, like that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> no, cool. So, yeah, so thank well, you for being my click moment. 
Um, and what was so special is kind of full circle as well, because you were there at the start of my camp journey. Um, and then unfortunately, the camp had to be sold in November. Hmm. And you replied to my email just as that was starting, the sale was starting to come through and they were starting to oh. transition out the old staff and change over. So you were there at the start of my journey wow. and you were there at the end of my journey too. You kept in touch with them all those years, seven years, eight years. Seven years. So seven years yeah, later, wow. it completely changed my life. And um, yeah, thank wow. you for being part of my click moment. I remember watching that video and being like, these are my people. The fact they are showing wow. me this and it completely resonated with me and what they were saying, what you were saying and what they were hoping to achieve together. I was like... It wasn't just a warm feeling. It wasn't, uh, I'm going to have fun. It was, yeah, it was like, it was like coming home. So thank you for being nice. my, my click moment. Cool. So thank yeah, you. so seven years later <laughs> and I get to Here speak we are. to you in person. So still, still a big fan. Thank you firstly for humoring me <laughs> in sharing that story. It feels very <laughs> um, indulgent to share a story like that when I have your brain um, for so little time. So thank you. <laughs> Um, so I would, enough about me, I would love the community to get to know more about you. And speaking of homes, both literal and metaphorical, where have you grown and flown? So where did you grow up and where uh -huh. would you consider home now? Nice rhyme. I like that. Grown and flown. Um, actually, I think it's kind of a defining thing about me. Is it no place, aka every place, feels like home. Meaning, um, I was born in California, but when I was five, I moved to Abingdon, England for my dad's work. Mm. Uh, so right outside of Oxford. So lived there at the age of five for a year. And to give the context, it was tough for me going from a little hippie freedom playing with animals <laughs> California school to a very strict uh, British school with the uniforms and the... Uh, angry, mean teachers that acted like I was the enemy. And mm -hmm. so I became, at the age of five, like defiantly American. I was like, I'm not from here. I'm from America. I'm from California. We play with animals there and everything is cool and everything here sucks and I hate it. This is terrible. I'm from California. And that whole year I lived in Abingdon, I was such a proud little American, right? Mm -hmm. So then after a year and a bit, we moved to, back to America, we moved to Chicago. Um, and I started at my new school and everybody called me the English kid because no, I had picked up the accent. And I was like, win. oh no, mommy, tell them. I'm not from England, I'm from California. Oh God. You know, and uh, so then I'm like, okay, well now I'm clearly not from here. I'm not one of you Hinsdale people. Um, sorry, Hinsdale outside of Chicago. That was mm -hmm. the town I grew up in. And a lot of the kids there had never left the state of Illinois. And here I was having like, not just lived in England, but traveled around Europe a lot. And so that was alienating. So I lived in Hinsdale, Illinois for 10 years. And then I moved to Boston. And I'm clearly not from there, but that's where I went to school for three years. Moved to New York City. Uh, and even though I love New York City, it's my comfort zone. I'm definitely not from there. I, mm. I feel no sense of like, I'm from here. Um, and it's been that way ever since. Everywhere I live, I feel like, well, I'm not from here. And so the effect that this has on me is... I always feel like society's norms don't apply to me. Mm. Like, okay, that's your rules, not those don't apply to me because I'm not from here. Yeah. So I think that's affected the way I think of everything. Mm. Who makes the rules? We make the rules. <laughs> um, no, that's in, so that's interesting. So you, despite having potentially a lot of homes, more than most people, you've never actually quite felt at home. Well, that's why I said kind of like nowhere is home, a.k.a. everywhere is home. It's like my definition of home is just wherever I'm settled right now. Like when I lived in Singapore, even after only a few months, a friend of mine said, don't you miss home? And I said, what do you mean? I, I'm home. I live here. I live in Singapore now. This is home. They're like, yeah, you know what I mean. But don't you really <laughs> miss home? I'm like, no, because no, there's no... This is equally home now. This is it. This is where I am. This is home. And then I moved to New Zealand and this is home. And, and yeah, where I am is home. I like that. 
I like that. Home within yourself. And where in that journey from California to now New Zealand, um, did you have your own click moments? Have there been any click moments? And particularly with um, creativity, that seems to be quite a running theme in your work. Hmm. Um, I'm going to leave the creativity out of it for a second because mm. just this is enough in the first half of that question. Um, to me, maybe maybe we have different definitions of this to me the click moments are more like this uh supercharged full battery feeling where you feel like um oh my god yes everything about this yes mm -hmm. uh but that can happen in a few different ways you know so i'm on stage at the ted conference mm -hmm. and there's uh, and like the big California main stage TED, where it's like, there's Bill Gates, there's Al Gore, there's the the guys that started Google. There's uh, like all these VIPs and they're looking at me like, okay, go tell us something. Mm -hmm. And I get up on stage and I give that first follower dancing guy talk. And even though I was nervous as hell, I was like, fucking right <laughs> this is like <laughs> this is good this this is congruent with who i am i like this i am fully happy with this moment and um there have been some moments like that romantically mm -hmm. you know when you're with somebody and you're just like mm, everything yes I, like this is so good yeah you know and there are moments like that travel wise i was writing uh, borrowed mopeds, scooters around central Vietnam wow. at two in the morning on a Wednesday night. We paid the guys at the hotel $5 to borrow their scooters for the night. And just driving, it's the town of Hue, H-U-E, with some squiggle over the E, <laughs> um, driving around like from, yeah, from like midnight to 3 a.m. on a Wednesday night in Vietnam in July. And it was just like, this is amazing. It was just like one of the top few moments of my life. Um, yeah, career-wise, um, it's often those moments where it's like, I did it. I've, a, mm -hmm. I've set out, I set out to do something and I've achieved it and I've done it. I mean, you must have had a good handful of these moments, just at least looking at your, uh, your stats, your your races and world <laughs> records and such. Um, that it's like to me, that's my definition of success, not a number in a bank account or not uh, what other people think at all. But it's like I set out to do something, mm -hmm. and I did it. Fuck yeah, that's such a good feeling. So to me, those are my you call them the click moments, but yeah, uh, yeah. But do you feel like that feeling of like yes? I did it. Do you feel like that is a sense of coming home to yourself? Oh, that being kind well, of true to your work. Cause that would be my, my yeah, definition true. of click would be that like right here in this moment, this is exactly where I'm meant to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think of that as coming home because maybe I have different associations with the word home, Yeah, but, um, but yeah, that's this is where I'm meant to be here. This is where, this is fully aligned with who I want to be. Even, yeah, meant meant to be is one way of putting it. That almost sounds like there's some, uh, uh, you know, somebody with puppet strings, uh, like fate and destiny and stuff. But no, like I think about um, who I've set out to be. And this is totally aligned with who I want to be. Yeah. I love that. And to be someone that can say, I did it, you do have to be mm -hmm. a doer. Um, and I Even internally. Like Mm. To be clear, like I did it isn't, doesn't have to be communicated mm. to the outside world. This has nothing to do with uh, posting something online or how anybody else perceives it. You could keep it secret. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that clarification is important um, to have things that are just for you. Um, but to, yeah. have, to have that feeling of, of like, I, I did it. Like I, I, even if it's just for yourself, I did yeah. the thing that I said I was going to do. You have to 
be a doer, right? You have to do the yeah. things. Um, and yeah. not everyone is prepared to do the things. Like it has to take a certain level of ambition to do that, I think. Like, and I I, th- I find ambition is an interesting one and people have different definitions of it. Like what does ambition mean to you? And do you find it like isolating at all to be a doer? Because I know I certainly have in the past. Mm, what does ambition mean to me? I think it just means thinking big. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, thinking big, aiming high. Uh, I take it for granted. To me, it's like, well, duh, obviously. You know, <laughs> What would be your dream scenario? What would be like the dream come true for you? Okay, so you figure that out. Well, there, go for that. I want Mm. that. So for you and I, that's obvious. But for a lot of people, like even asking them to make their dream scenario is like, "Mm, mm, I don't know, I guess I'd like to have my bills paid. (laughs) You know, it's like this this sad um, aiming so low and the thought of doing making their uh, dream scenario come true is just like out of the question. They just looked at you like, no, what? No, (laughs) haha, very funny. But no, I'm just trying to get my bills paid, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to relate to somebody that has that mindset, especially because then it affects their actions, right? It's like, well, if all you're hoping to do is to get your bills paid, well, it's 5 p.m. and you've come home from work. So there's just nothing you can do until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., I guess. So I'll just sit here and watch TV for six hours until mm-hmm. I fall asleep. And then I'll go to work tomorrow to make a little more money. Because um, all I'm really doing here is just paying my bills. <laughs> I can't. It's so hard for me to relate to that kind of life. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Just um, I, I just it's it's just perplexing to me. But what do you think like helps you be a doer? Do you think it's something like innate within you or just like, so I know for me, and this is something I work on a lot with my clients is like my values are like the foundation of everything I do. So for me, as long as I know what my values are and I'm clear with that, it's easy to be a doer because I know that everything I'm doing is moving me closer towards the thing I value. Whereas actually if I wasn't in line with my values, I actually would find it very hard to be a doer what 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 do you feel like it's like for you um is it the most important thing is to demystify it's to know the next steps so values yes sure but if you don't know the next step you can't really take a step Mm -hmm. you know uh it really helps to demystify, to to look at something like, I don't know, just pick something. Like, let's say if I wanted to be a Hollywood movie star, um, I would need to break that down and say, okay, well, what would that take? Mm-hmm. And break it into some smaller steps and just see even a bit of the pathway there. Saying, okay, well, probably the first thing is I should probably be in Hollywood. But let's say uh, I'm unable to go there for the next three months until I finish something I'm doing here. So for the next three months, here's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start to contact a lot of people that I know that are in that industry or close to it and ask who they would recommend. I'll start to meet those people. I'm going to read a couple books on how the industry works. I would just start to take steps to that. And I would... um, maybe analyze, I'd probably get kind of like a a stylist or somebody because a lot of that, it's like being a model. I would probably take acting classes Mm -hmm. immediately, um, but just start right away where I am. Like just find somebody, even if I was living in the middle of uh, Uzbekistan, I would find a local acting coach and just begin to take those steps and move towards what seems like an unobtainable goal for other people. I would just break it, like demystify it, break it down into steps and just get started on those easy steps. Nice. Yeah, I like it. I I do something called like the pyramid of change. So for me, mm-hmm. I, I, I want to be clear on what my values are to start, like just as a starting point. 
I don't even have mm-hmm. to have action there necessarily. It's just being clear with those. And then the pyramid of change is I kind of, I will have, I'll pick my big goal or dream. It could literally be anything I want as far out as I want, but then I'll work backwards. So that could be like, what does my like ultimate life goal look like? What mm-hmm. could that look like in, like, where would I need to be in five years towards that? Where would I need to be in one year towards that? Where would I need right. to be in 90 days, 30 days a week? And then eventually you're at a day. So it's kind of like you're, the rest actually ends up being forgot about and kind of redundant, but you work away all the way back to like, what is basically what you're saying? What is the first step? What is the next step? What do I need to do just next? And then looking at it, yeah. what do I need to do in a, like today and doing it like that? I had never thought of this before. Mm-hmm. But I want to propose an idea. In music, I, you've got a guitar behind you. Do you play music? I do, yes. Okay. I wouldn't say I'm the best, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would say I'm the best? <laughs> yes. No, I'm I the wouldn't best. say I'm the so, best. I know, I know, I know. That was funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who would? Anyway, um, so, um, uh, so there's music first mm-hmm. and then theory later. So mm-hmm. first, somebody plays, mm, mm, like combines these two chords, mm-hmm. or just kind of plunks their fingers in a certain way and goes, ooh, I like the sound of that. And then later, somebody says, well, you know what you just did? You did a B flat 13th with a, you know, with a, <laughs> with a flat five. You know, oh, all right. Well, I just like the way it sounds. So I wonder if the values thing you're talking about mm-hmm. might be a bit like the music theory that comes later. Mm. That sometimes we just get an instinctual gut feeling of like, ooh, this is what I want. Yes, I want that. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is congruent. This is me. I want this 100%. I yeah. have no mixed feelings about this. I want this. Mm-hmm. And then later you might look at that and go, huh, I guess my values might be such and such because I want that. Yeah. But it can come from that gut, ooh, I want this feeling first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. And I, I love the analogy as well. I think that's so beautifully put. Yeah, and I definitely think it like, for me, it's that's where like connection's important, like being really aware and like connected to yourself and being yeah. open to those moments, being uh, like aware of those, oh, I really, because I, I feel like some people don't even have that awareness right they're going through life and they might be either ignoring that oh I really want that or even not aware of those moments Mm. you know and not really open to them sometimes um so I think part of that the importance is being being aware of those moments too to be able to go with them I saw in one of your past interviews that you have Mm -hmm. a question that's something like um not what is your superpower but what is your expertise Mm -hmm. your specialty or something like that Mm -hmm. is that a common question of yours um on elevator expert yes i do have a um very bespoke elevator (laughs) that sometimes um experts step into so yes they they might share their expertise on that yeah yeah okay uh i forget where i heard you ask that question but uh Mm -hmm. It made me go like, huh, well, I'm going to be talking with Meg Mm -hmm. uh, in a couple months. I wonder what mine is. And I think that um, reflecting is where I've learned everything. Mm. That When you read a book, you're taking in information. But by my definition, you don't really learn it until you reflect and internalize it. So I spend more time than most people... um, reflecting uh, in my journal for me. I mean, it could be for anything. It could be just conversations with a friend or uh, laying down and staring at the sky and thinking. But for me, I like having my fingers on the keys and moving and thinking out loud like that. Yeah. Um, so I spend a lot of time reflecting and internalizing the information I've taken in recently or things that have happened to me in processing. I spend a lot of time with that and I ask myself a lot of questions very skeptical of anything I say 
you know, why did you do this? Uh, I did this because ABC. Like, is that really true? <laughs> Am I just lying <laughs> to myself? Actually, hmm, that's probably not the real reason, is it? You know, like I have these kind of dialogues with myself. I mean, not literally, but um, that kind of doubt of myself and pushing a little further to not even believe my first response mm. to myself. Um, and and looking at it from other points of view and like that kind of reflecting and applying everything I've taken in, I think is my expertise. Mm, I love that reflection. And on reflection, what do you think is the most important question you've ever asked yourself? No, <laughs> there's not one like that. It's, not it's one. situational. No, mm -hmm. there's not one. There's not like one single moment that changed my whole life. No, it's, it's situational. Um, I mean, sorry, the, if you needed an answer... I don't know I would say an answer, no, no. The, the, the <laughs> most useful question that can be used again and again in every scenario is something like, how can I make the best of this? Mm. Because things do happen. We get ourselves into certain situations and have certain restrictions and uh, surprises disappointments and so i've found it extremely useful to again and again and again over whatever 20 years ask uh how can i make the best of this and keep pushing with that question yeah. and again not just believe the first answer or the second answer but keep pushing until i've got 20 answers or more and then something feels like Ooh, that's a good idea yes in fact this thing that i was really upset about an hour ago I'm now really excited about. In fact, now I'm really glad that that so-called mistake upset happened because I've just found a way to make the best of this and I'm so glad that that just happened. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think my question, like my most important question usually starts with why. I think that mm -hmm. for me, it's a very simple question, but that for me, I think probably my most important questions have started with why. Or maybe it's mm. sometimes literally just why. I feel like that mm. brings the best out of me in terms of answering. Hmm. See, that to me, I, do you know the word confabulate? Confabulation? Mm -hmm. that, that to me, I worry, brings out confabulation, where we make up rationalizations. We make up reasons. But... Although I would I say, if you, if you don't mind to explain that word for the listeners in case they don't. Oh, yeah, sorry. Confabulate. Hello, <laughs> listeners. Um, confabulate. <laughs> the, uh, the dictionary says, no. Um, <laughs> confabulate means to um, come up with reasons. So the, the word root fabule, fabule is like to fabricate, mm -hmm. fabulate, confabulate, to put together reasons i think that's the con and the confabulate put together reasons uh to explain something that you actually don't have an explanation for you're inventing a reason because somebody's asking for a reason so the best story of this is um brain researchers mm. uh that there are some people in the world that have had the left and the right hemisphere of their brain split um wow. and with these people they can do these uh, experiments that they can show a message to only their right eye. They can put goggles on them and show a message to only their right eye wow. saying, please uh, close the window. And the person will get up and close the window. And then, then they can ask their left ear or their left eye, um, why did you close the window? And the person will say, well, it was cold in here. They say, is that the only reason you called it? Yeah, I, I was feeling a little cold. Sorry, I, I just felt like getting up to close the window. So... That's pure confabulation, right? They made mm -hmm. up a reason to explain their own behavior when, in fact, they didn't know. Their, the left half of their brain did not know why they got up to close the window. Mm -hmm. But if asked, the brain can't accept the fact that it doesn't know. So whenever you ask yourself why, you will come up with an answer, but you are likely as not to be just making one up. 
Well, there we go. <laughs> I might have to Sorry, find don't mean a new to, question. <laughs> don't mean to shit on your best question. I know. Journaling tonight is now going to be really hard. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. <laughs> a whole bunch of hows and what's I and know. where's instead when. of why. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to find some new words. Thanks. Um, new challenge for 2023. Um, but despite taking away my favorite question, um, I am, you have been a, um, a big indirect mentor of mine through your work over the seven years now that I've uh, come across your work. Have there been any mentors in your own life? Mm, yeah. Um, Seth Godin, very directly. I know him. Maybe say we're friends. We've hung out a few times. We've talked on the phone a few times. But I don't reach out to him as often as I think to, I very often think to myself, what would Seth Godin say? Mm. If I were to call him now and ask him, what would he say? Because I know his thought process a bit. So then I'll instead just answer for myself what Seth Godin would say. Uh, there's another guy uh, named Jared Rose that was like a coach, like literally a, I hired him as a coach uh, for a few years. And often then later, I would think about reaching out to him. And I think, well, I know him pretty well. What would Jared say? <laughs> and again, I'll just do that process and kind of come to my own answer based on what I think Jared would probably say. Mm -hmm. um, little bit Tony Robbins. Uh, that was like a huge... Tony Robbins' book called the, uh, Awaken, Awaken the Giant, the Giant? Within mm -hmm. was, was like the Bible to me. I read it at a really formative age and read it many times and really internalized it so much that I think it's like, it's um, philosophy is like my religion in a way without me realizing it. You know, like somebody that was just grew up in Sicily and was just uh, raised Catholic and just wouldn't even question it or not even realize how Catholic their beliefs are. Um, my belief system is very <laughs> Tony Robbins <laughs> uh, without me even realizing it anymore. Um, yeah, I think that's that's mostly it. There's one. Okay, I'll, I'll name drop one more. Erica Lemay, E R I K A. I haven't heard of Erica. L E M A Y. You will. Um, <laughs> you should. You actually. You, Meg, should read her book called Almost Perfect. Okay. You would really like it. It. Uh, I think she's got a similar approach to life as you do. She is a uh, aerial artist um, mm. that has a uh, is very, very, very driven. And disciplined and um but yet balanced so yeah she's got an amazing approach to life that i really admire and uh yeah i often think of what would erica do no oh, they're a good mentor if you're thinking what would that i've thought many a time what will derek do um and oh. did you, <laughs> and did you. you say almost perfect yeah i think that's episode. the name of her book yeah I will find I it and I will it. also put it in the show notes for others to find. Oh, cool. um, and as a author yourself, and also by the sounds of it, a fellow bookworm, I personally find like so many books have been mentors to me. Yes. Do you have some books? Uh, you mentioned Awaken the Giant and Almost There, but are there any other books that you found that have been really pivotal to your thinking and got you thinking in a different way? I just think of them all as tools in mm -hmm. a toolbox, right? I, except for that one Awaken the Giant Within, which because I read it, 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 it was like the first book like that I had ever read, right? And yeah. I was 19 years old. So, but every book since then, I should say, has felt like another tool in the toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. So I can read Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. I can say, instead of feeling like this is my new Bible, um, Let's just say I don't turn ideas into ideologies. Even if the author is trying to pitch an ideology saying you should follow this um, ideology, this religion that I am prescribing to you, dear reader, I kind of have this skeptical kind of, yeah, 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 okay. This is just, this is another tool. Yeah. I don't need to buy in completely to your system. Um, so no, since then I don't have any... Uh, one single book that made a huge change in my life like that. But instead, the books collectively absolutely have made a massive 
change in my life. I'd say the biggest change in my life, besides my time spent reflecting, has come from the books themselves. I probably read about, I don't know, 40 or so good nonfiction books per year. And um, a lot. I'd say more than half of them are really damn good and stay in my thinking process. So as I'm just making daily choices in life, mm. I'm constantly referring to the books that I've read. And I keep detailed notes on all the books I've read. So it's easy for me now to, in 10 minutes, reread my notes from a book that I actually read 10 years ago. I don't have to pick up the whole 350 page book and read it from scratch again. While reading it the first time, I jotted down my favorite ideas from it so that now I can just go back and read that text file with the ideas in it. Um, and listeners, if you haven't seen it already, you should um, go to my website at siv.rs slash book, B-O-O-K. And I decided years ago to start posting all of my book notes. So now there's almost 400 book notes there from the books I've read since 2007. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I post my detailed notes on the site so that you can not use them as a replacement for the book, but use them to judge whether you should read this book. I've been there myself. And as a fellow bookworm, it is book note heaven. <laughs> and I, I personally love it. I love hearing other people's thoughts on books and the fact that you might have different takeaways from mine right. and read the same thing as me, but seen it completely yeah. differently. Or um, that we've be both read the same thing and I'm like, oh, yeah, we have we had the same thoughts on that. So I, I love that. Um, and also that you've shared those as well. I think it's a real gift to other people to take that, see a different opinion and then make their own as well. Thanks. You're very welcome. <laughs> um, and you you touched on it before, but I would definitely um, say that one of the things I also love about you is that you're really not someone to be stuck to conventions. <laughs> mm. um, and I, I probably like the unconventional too much. I'm very much someone that if everyone's doing it just because everyone's doing it, I very quickly lose interest in doing it myself. Mm -hmm. personally um what would you say was probably the most unconventional decision of your career and how did that turn out for you um i don't think in the i mean i do have an answer to that question but it's more important to say that i don't really think in terms of most unconventional because I'm really just disregarding the norms and just thinking of everything for myself mm -hmm. from scratch. Like if somebody says, well, what everybody does is, I'm just going to use a technical one because it's the top of my head right now. What everybody does is they use JavaScript, they use ReactJS to put a chunk of JavaScript in JSON, which is then interpreted by a template in your browser. And that's what everybody does. So... Like, really, everybody, that's how we make websites. That's how we do it. But I'll look at that and say, but that doesn't make sense for me. That's not how I want to do it. The way that I'd rather do it is to just have the Ruby script on my server generate the HTML and just dish it up with no JavaScript. And it's not that I'm trying to be unconventional. It's just that I just see those as two different things. What's good for them versus what's good for me. So whatever the rest of the world does, I say, okay, well, I'm glad that's working for you. But I need to figure out what works for me. And it's not a reaction to what's working for you. Um, it really is just needing to think of it myself from scratch. And maybe the thing you're describing works for me too. Um, mm -hmm. if, <laughs> if a if wire cutter says that they've reviewed 50 sets of Bluetooth headphones and this one is the best i think all right i'll just buy that one then I don't, I don't need to reinvent that from scratch i don't need to try 100 but um but when it comes to life things and how people live their life um yeah i don't i don't re i need i don't react against them but i just think of i just assume that my needs are different mm. than other people's needs um, and just think of it for myself. So, um, 
Now, to answer your question, the the ones that I'd say people would say were the biggest uh, was when I sold my company for $22 million. And when thinking of it myself from scratch to realize I didn't want the money. And so I put it all into a charitable trust before I even sold the company. I, I donated my company into a charitable trust first before selling it so that when the purchasing company bought it, they bought it not from me, but from the trust so that that $22 million never touched my hands. Wow. Um, and that just came from, yeah, real soul searching of like asking what I want out of my life and um, what mattered to me, my values and who I want to be and how I want to live. And having $20 million was not something I wanted. I felt better uh, not having it so I wouldn't accidentally do something stupid with it mm -hmm. that made me happier than having it was, you know, preventing my future self from doing something stupid. So, um, yeah, so I put it into this charitable trust thing. Okay, so that's one example. Um, but let's say, like, how I've raised my kid around the world. Mm -hmm. um, every parent says uh, kids need stability. And they use that as some kind of excuse to just, like, shut down their life and make their life so small and just stay at home and watch TV because kids need stability. Mm. But that's, that's not true. <laughs> the kids' stability comes from the emotional connection. The parents, they, they could be, uh, you could get on a plane every day for the rest of your life and have stability if you have, like, the emotional connection and if you can feel safe and stable uh, anywhere on earth, I'd argue that that's more stability than sticking in one little place in Cleveland, Ohio and not leaving because kids need stability. Mm. You know? So, um, so I've raised my kid around the world so far. He just turned 11. Um, so I think that's been a little unconventional. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd almost have to have, it, it's interviews like this. Sometimes when people tell me what's unconventional about me and sometimes I don't even realize it like I'm just being me yes and then I'm, somebody says oh you know the way you are that's that's really weird I say really yeah How so and they say like this I go oh that's interesting thank you I didn't know that and um, thank you, you you're sorry you're nodding you can relate yeah no I can't and, and that's why I'm so that's why I really wanted to ask you that question because I find it mm. so interesting because I feel like even the fact like the word like unconventional it's more and you broke it down so beautifully is like other people's like opinions so yeah. like when I'd said like what is the most con um, unconventional thing you do have done I love the fact that you broke down to like what other people might have thought is unconventional because right. I think very few people at least I certainly don't walk around going like mm, I'm gonna do something unconventional <laughs> like no Look it's usually me. other people's yeah. opinion of what you're doing that they think is like against the norm or, right Right. Whereas for you, it's just, I'm just being me. I'm just doing my thing. Right. right? Like you, you'd mentioned like you'd been on my website and saw things. It was like, well, you've done some pretty far out there things for me. I'm just like, I'm just being me going about my life, doing the things that make sense to me. So, um, yeah. I love, thank you for taking the time to, and the care to really go into that question. I really appreciate your answer. It's funny that it's really a reaction of the observer noticing how different your choices are from theirs. Exactly. Right? So in America, it's very normal to leave home at the age of 18, mm -hmm. go away to college, and then from college you go away to another city and never go back to your little hometown except to visit. And then I moved to Singapore, and a good friend of mine was a um even like she was like a self-help blogger like very i want to say she is not somebody you would have thought of as provincial right mm. she seemed to be very like online very connected to the world but yet when she was asking about my life she said oh, you left home at 17 <laughs> you moved away when you were 17 you never moved back she's like god aren't your parents upset aren't they mad Mm -hmm. I mean, aren't they insulted? Wasn't that like the ultimate slap in the face to them? It's like, wait, what? What are you saying? She's like, but you you left home. 
that's so insulting. I said, wait, no, that's, to me, that's normal. Everybody does that. I said, really? That's like, that's insulting to you? She said, yeah. Here in Singapore, like we all tend to live with our parents until our 30s. And to leave home at 17 would be the hugest insult. That would be like saying that I hate you. Oh my Weird. So that was, so her thinking that this was unconventional about me doesn't necessarily mean that what I was doing was unconventional. Exactly. It's just unconventional to her values and her culture, right? So I, there are, um, I think maybe in Silicon Valley, mm. the idea of giving away a ton of money to charity is not that weird. Mm -hmm. And then when I was asked to speak to, in, in India to a group of business investors, uh, they said, D don't talk about that. We don't do that here. It will just be insulting. Like, Indians do not give away their money to charity. They mm -hmm. save it for their family. Um, so don't rub that in people's faces. Please don't mention that. I went, wow. So like the that idea is very um, beyond unconventional, just you know, yeah. straight up stupid or something like that. So um, yeah, anyway, it's all just a reflection of the observer. You're just being you. And if people tell you you're unconventional, it's because you just differ from their values. Exactly. Thank you. And I completely agree. And so thank you for taking the time and care to answer that question in such depth. Because I say, I think, I think I didn't. Yeah. I, I Can you have an unconventional opinion of yourself? I don't think you can. I think unconventional yeah. <laughs> can only be someone else's observation or view of you. But for example, yeah. when I said like, I kind of, I think to other people, it's that appearance of, I kind of, go towards the unconventional but for me it's just it's what's right for me and so yeah. in my brain if I'm I'm doing something and then everyone wants to do it because everyone's doing it in my head like I won't not do it just for the sake of it for example to be unconventional but for me it kind of and how my brain works it just sparks that creativity then of like hmm, well if we're all doing it this way then like what other ways are there out there doing it if we're all doing the same right thing, you know Ooh, meg there's a quote you might like that said something like if everybody's thinking the same thing then nobody is thinking mm, love that love that exactly and that's like my response to it so like you said other people could think then oh like well she's quite unconventional and it's like well no i'm just like you said just being me and <laughs> doing what's right for yeah. my brain yeah and unconventional. <laughs> I think unconventional. sometimes when uh, us uh, weirdos who share the same uh, unconventional values, when we spot each other, it's it's like uh, two dogs, you know, across the street, you know, <laughs> dogs walking, oh, 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 and suddenly, oh my god, oh my god, there's another one like me. Oh, oh. Yeah, so, um, yeah that's, you know, when I mentioned uh, Erica LeMay earlier mm -hmm. with the the book Almost Perfect, so uh, Erica actually reached out to me uh, a few years ago, and we got to be good friends, and. Um, there was that same sense of recognition, like, oh, my God, you're like me. Cool. Mm, I love that. It was that. nice to meet a fellow weirdo. <laughs> that one of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you actually know the reference of that? One of us. One of us. No, I don't know. Where, where's that originally oh, from? I, the funny thing mate. is, I always say that with when I'm out with my dog. If he sees another cockapoo and gets excited, oh. I go, one of us. <laughs> You should find the original. It is a movie from the 1920s oh. called Freaks. Okay. And I think Sounds you can find it. I think, it's, I think it's out of copyright control. You can find it on like archive.org or similar sites. It's a fascinating movie because they actually went and found the, um, the circus. It was a movie made of like circus freaks, which are just people with physical deformities. Mm. You know, the, the, the guy born without legs and arms. The um, and people that had various like disorders and diseases that made them look like freaks, and the people that would put on the shows, they actually went to one of these circuses and got a bunch of the performers, or I should say performers, just the the freaks, mm -hmm. and made a movie with them about wow. a normal woman that comes in to join the circus, and the one of us moment is when even though she's like. Marilyn Monroe, blonde, you know, cliche, beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, they realize that, like, you're weird like us. And so this table full of people of 
like the super tall, the, the super short, the, mm-hmm. the the guy without legs or arms and the, the bearded lady and all that are like around the table going, one of us, one of us, one of us, I like you're one it. of us. Yeah, so That's the oh. origin of that phrase. You should um, see the original movie. It's I saw it once years ago and never forgot it. Oh, I'm definitely going to have to watch it. And it literally, that kind of sounds like it sums up exactly what we're saying of that unconventional, right? Because they're not, they're not freaks that's other people's opinion to that and like the idea that she's normal that's our opinions of each other whereas everyone's just being me (laughs) navigating life yeah do you know jody cook the name rings a bell uh, you should have her on the show power lifter uh power lifter and former publicist entrepreneur uh power lifter and uh She's from Birmingham originally and traveling the world mm. with her husband right now and uh, was just here in Wellington for a couple months. And we went to go see Mark Manson's new movie, uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Uh, they made a movie out of it. Oh, I'm so excited and, for this to come out. Well, we we liked it, but her comment upon leaving the cinema was, uh, she said, I think that's a movie for normal people. <laughs> like, you and I are already kind of living this Mm. thing that mark's talking about and um normal people still need to hear that she said i think you and i have already internalized that lived um, it yeah mm, i love that Definitely. normal people so so like you just said sorry i was reversing where you said mm. the freaks and the normal and whatever yes. so to me it's like as as a freak at the table to me calling somebody a normal person it's someone who's just not insult. like doesn't think like me Right, but it's Whereas but it's to a like normal the, um, person, a freak would be an insult. Right, right. So I I find being called weird I take as a compliment. Mm. Being called a freak a compliment. Me calling somebody normal is a bit of an insult. Let's just say almost an insult. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends where you're sat at the t- your view from the table. I guess. Yeah. But no, I love that, and I um. Wh- Another thinker that I love is uh, Kevin Kelly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and he does his lessons for his birthday. And I just recently had my 30th birthday and I wanted to do my own take of it and did 30 lessons. I listened to it. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, But one (laughs) of those was, um, you know, if they're calling you a little bit weird, if that's the worst thing they've got on you, then you're definitely doing something (laughs) right. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah, I definitely think I would be a, a freak at the table quite happily. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for being right there with me. Two dogs at different ends of the street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of us, for sure. Um, <laughs> and something I wanted to talk to, for someone who has like a kind of a bit of a background in, in technology, let's say your website is very impressive. I don't know how you create your website, but I know it's impressive <laughs> how you. um, you're able to make it so simple. Um, but there's a lot of brain work behind that potentially. So something I'm interested to talk to you about is technology, because I think something that potentially could be seen as unconventional at the moment that I think is going to become very conventional is AI. And so I'm interested, well, my fear is, well, there is a fear at the moment from a lot of people. (laughs) Can you say I'm trying to get my brain around this big subject? Um, There's a fear that AI could come in and take away a lot of humans kind of work and also uh the kind of make human work redundant i guess and interactions redundant and as a also creative human what are your thoughts on the role of technology in kind of entrepreneurship and business today i think we've always automated away the things that are done just as well by automation. Mm -hmm. Um, Kevin Kelly actually has a wonderful book called What Technology Wants, Mm -hmm. where he makes a great argument that there are some things that are actually improved by being automated. So say, for example, the reason that those Toyota, for example, cars, but really all cars these days, are so reliable is that they were made by 
computers and like laser precise machines. They weren't made by, uh, you know, Giuseppe, who's been making cars for 60 years in Sicily, handmade the old fashioned way. I, you know, I'd rather have a car made with laser precision machines instead of uh, Giuseppe, um, who I would want to make uh, maybe my shoes or suit or something like that that's more uh, artistic i would want a a human to make art i would want art made by a human but cars made by a machine mm. and so it's up to each of us to think um what aspects of what we're doing would actually be better done by a machine and what aspects would be bit better done by a human mm. um so yeah, there's something people ask how I answer emails so fast. Um, so, yeah, anybody listening, I have a notoriously open inbox. So right on my website is my email address. And I welcome strangers to email me. And I really like it. Well, like you heard at the beginning of this recording, you know, yes. how much I loved getting Meg's first email. <laughs> it's like I get 100 emails a day, but damn, that one was memorable. That was great. And occasionally I get ones like that. I just like I, I get um, really impressive interesting people interesting to me impressive mm -hmm. to me and i love meeting them and so i really love that they reached out just took the time to say like hi my name is so i'm a poet in slovenia you know yeah listening to your podcast right now and how cool i know a poet in slovenia now badass i love that you know so um but people ask how do i do that it's like well because i've automated my most frequently used sentences like i've just noticed over the years that they're like at any given time there are about 50 or so sentences that i re i use often Wh whether it's as short as thank you very much or as long as um well since you asked here's my answer to this common question da -da 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 -da, a couple paragraphs so what i've done is i've just assigned hotkeys to my most common sentences so now this is like kind of a human automation hybrid where it is me choosing it it's you're not getting an automated form letter. I'm reading your email, but I'm able to reply in like five seconds because I'm reading it and just like I hit like my four sentences that apply to this situation. It took me four keystrokes to hit them. And uh, I had a few more words that do not fit into any form letter and I hit send. And I'm able to just do this and go through emails in like 10 seconds each. And for me, that works. So that's like a hybrid of me deciding but automated some of this stuff away. But I wouldn't want to, for example, have an AI answer the emails for me mm. because that would defeat the purpose. I want to see the emails. I want to make my personal human decision in the moment on how to respond to that email. Even if in the future it might just be a single keystroke handles the whole email, but I still want to look at it to know. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the so same thing with um writing a lot of people talk about uh using gpt for generating content as they say which even <laughs> yeah. just saying once they say generating content you know they're really talking about garbage generating garbage um so how can i generate more garbage you know surprisingly that's not a question i ask myself a lot how can i generate more garbage <laughs> but some people do they think i need clicks i need google adsense whatever Followers, views yeah I need followers. I need to generate some more garbage. Look, here's something that can generate some garbage for me. Look, I can just click some buttons and it starts spewing out some garbage. This will get me some more clicks. Um, so no, that's not an interest of mine. Um, instead, it feels like it raises the bar to, you know, it raises the value of surprising ideas that... A, uh, a bullshit generator would not come up with. Mm. Yeah, I love that insight. And I was, I was talking to a friend about it the other day. Um, and yeah, my, my view on it is actually like, I think it can be a positive thing. Like, I don't think we can avoid it. It's coming, um, which makes it sound like some sort of tidal wave. <laughs> but, um, it's, yeah, I think it's learning to work with it. And actually, when when you think of mm -hmm. it like that, actually, it can help you bring out the best in you because it helps you realize, yeah. like, what other things, like, a robot couldn't replace. What are, just, like, you've literally created your own hotkey of your unique answers and sayings, the things that are uniquely you. So, yes, you might, for ease of time, like, you're using it to help you. 
um, generate those responses, but actually those key words and phrases are uniquely you and it's actually taking mm-hmm. you time to think about hmm, what are the things that are very me that I say the most but the the one thing that I do have fear about this coming in and I think it's because I'm already seen kind of the sad side of it is kind of technology's involvement increasing involvement in music now, this is kind of, I guess, like it's it's a difficult one because music has, has advanced so much because of technology. But um, I'm a huge music fan and I've got so much nostalgia for being younger and I would save up my money to buy my favorite cassette or CD. Mine was my first CD was a well, cassette was the Spice Girls. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but the excitement of saving up this money over time, I had to physically go to a store to buy it. Mm. Then having that anticipation, excitement to go all the way home and then listen to it. And then I would get to listen to the whole album in its entirety. And you'd really hear the story and the journey that the um, musician is trying to like take you on. Um, And I just, I worry that with technology now, it's, I feel like it's taken some of the journey away from the music because everything is so instantly accessible. Like if you even think about it, there's no like care, unless you've got a real special loved one, there's no like carefully curated mixtapes anymore. There's, but there's tons Mm -hmm. of, generic playlists to try and get um that what's the most popular songs that people are going to listen to um and you know we have the shuffle button <laughs> what's going to come on randomly and also i feel like like singles are favored much more than albums so like for you mm-hmm. having created something like cd baby which i think so personally the way i well what i especially loved it and the success I saw from it was because it it took the customer on such a personal journey, like the journey of it was so special. How do you feel about like the current state of music consumption? Like, do you, what are your thoughts basically on how technology has kind of affected that area? I'm going to actually connect it to the thing that we talked about. Um, 20 or 30 minutes ago about norms that it doesn't matter that most people now consume Spotify on a random shuffle. It doesn't matter that more and more artists are just putting out individual songs and not making albums really anymore they might collect 12 of those songs but it's not really an album as you're describing it doesn't matter that most people do this and more people do that what matters is that you don't have to Mm -hmm. you know your preference so you can still go buy a, a stevie wonder album from 1973 that is very much an album you can still get a miles davis album that is very much an album Mm. Um, and you can still find that one in a hundred musicians today that also really care about the album as an album and something, you know, a journey to take you on. They still exist. So it doesn't really matter that most don't do that Mm. and that most of your 30 year old peers don't care about this. Uh, just doesn't matter. Like we don't need to bemoan it. In fact, um, you know, you could look at the way that the music industry was in the 1950s. There basically weren't albums in the 1950s. Like this whole idea of an album was a thing that became a thing in the 1960s through maybe 90s mm. and then faded away again. But if you love that thing that had its heyday for 30 years, you've got tons to choose from. And there are a lot of musicians still who agree with you. And know the deeper happiness of of an album and are still making those. So yeah, it doesn't matter that most don't. That's my yeah. take on it. We don't need to moan about what the rest of the people are doing or that most people aren't um, 
there's still plenty for us to choose from. Very true. And it's it's a beautiful message. And trust me, I still live in the 90s <laughs> most of the time. In fact, I was a 90s radio <laughs> presenter for a good amount of time. I was called the Queen oh, wow. of Cheese. Um, that wasn't a self-appointed title. <laughs> I got that for a while. <laughs> Purely because I wanted to live in the 90s and have my happy place for a little bit more. And I found my other people that wanted to be in the 90s for uh, an hour or two a day, every Tuesday. But see what's funny? <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me if you were born in like 1979, but you were born in 92 or 91, 93, right? 93. Mm-hmm. 93. Oh, you just turned 30. Okay. Just, yeah. So, um, So that's kind of funny to me that like you were, you know, crawling you were a toddler in the 90s and yet that's your nostalgia most people have a nostalgia for the time when they were a teenager right so if you were yeah. born in 79 then uh you were a teenager in the 90s and like okay, that would be your deep nostalgia why do you think it is that that time the music of that time reaches you the most i think well for, for me i definitely know that i have such um like lovely memories of being in my dad's car drive he, like he would drive us around to school or whether nursery and he would have bands on like oasis blur um and yeah like all these bands and like just hearing them over again like my mum is convinced mm. park life may well have been one of my first words <laughs> um but i think that was a real nostalgic time of that bond like with my dad and having the music on in the car and i think that's the first time um I really have like a real vivid memory of like music and really starting to appreciate wow. it. And there were other um, albums as well. We had um, what the prodigy, we had some Abba gold, um, but yeah, really listen. And because we'd be on a journey, we'd hear the whole album together. So yeah, I yeah. think at that time I just remember being young and that was my first real like exposure to music. And also I think mm. seeing the joy that my dad had for these albums um, and that mm. really transferred across. So when I went to go buy my own album, being like the Spice Girls, having that own excitement for myself, like, oh, I'm going to have yeah. my own CD, my own album that I can take care of and love. Mm. So I think that's why particularly the 90s was was nostalgic for me. Wow. Um, and I think, yeah, just a lot of family time at that time. I've got three brothers spending that time with them and hearing my older mm. brother's music as well, I think. Oh, okay, that makes okay. That adds a little more to it. Interesting. Wow. And it's funny. I've raised my kid listening to a lot of esoteric music. Like mm. when we would play with Lego for hours and hours and hours, our usual default music to put on in the background was Indian classical music. Wow. And I wonder if you know my kid when he's thirty is just going to have this like deep nostalgia for Indian <laughs> classical music because <laughs> that's what me and my dad used to just listen to for hours while making Lego. You know, it's very specific. So I feel like you would be mm. the one to point at there. Um, <laughs> I'm not mm. sure where else he would have found that from. Um, mm. But I know if that is the case, he'll have very fond memories of of his dad. Um, Mm. and I feel like, uh, kind of going back to what we said earlier, I definitely, for me, I feel like you can have click moments from a song as well. So like Mm. I hear, I hear those songs and it is, it's that click moment of, um, (laughs) kind of like one to take actually is I remember hearing, uh, just like, uh, here's another, um, well, they're more eighties, but I heard them in the nineties. Um, just like heaven by the cure. I remember listening to that song and being like, Bear in mind, I was very young at the time, so I wouldn't know. But like just a knowing in myself of like, that's what love feels like in a song to me. Wow. Huh. So I wouldn't have been old enough to even really experience what love <laughs> actually is like. But I remember listening yeah, to that, but... that song and being like, huh, that that's, feels like love in a song. Wow. Do you want to hear two songs that practically make me cry? I would Every love time to. was it's surprising is find the song Birthday by Sugar Cubes, which is actually Bjork's first band from Iceland. Oh. And the lyrics are nonsense. I don't care what the lyrics are saying, but the chorus is her just wailing. And it's this mm-hmm. melody. It's it's hard for me to even imitate. It's like oh, 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 oh. it's just Bjork just just wailing full-throated <laughs> as the chorus 
And there's just something about it that just hits me viscerally and like brings a tear to my eye. Um, yeah, so find that one, Birthday by Sugar Cubes. And another one is so cliche. I didn't hear it until long after my teenage years. I was probably even after 30. But Killing in the Name of by Rage mm. Against the Machine. <laughs> when I heard that song, I actually got a little like teary-eyed because the that refrain of like fuck you i won't do what you tell me fuck you i won't do what you tell me it's like it brought up my like inner 14 year old yeah. or it's like it, that part of me that's still in there that little 14 year old that was like so angry and felt so um oppressed and uh i was so upset i was so angry from age like 14 to 16 and uh that song speaks right to that part of myself that's still in there so whenever i hear killing in the name of and especially you know that ending i just like get a little little watery eyed like yeah it's still in there oh i love that see i've got fond memories of that song but more so because i have so two of my brothers are older and my oldest brother would he'd ask for an album for christmas it would have a lot of swear words and be explicit so my parents would say no so he would then of course mm. go to my nan and just okay. write it down on the Christmas list. So poor, <laughs> um, so poor, poor Nan would just take the paper and go into the local. It was HMV here in the UK at the time, and yeah. be like, "I would like um, shake your ass, please," and <laughs> like killing in the name of. And then he would, yeah. of course, be absolutely um, ecstatic with himself at Christmas when he'd unwrap it and then start playing it. <laughs> Nice. And my nan would be absolutely mortified of uh, the lyrics that would be playing, um, oh, and she'd have a lot necessary. to answer for with my with my parents. But uh, those urges need to be. If somebody's got such a strong urge, I think it's better to just like let it come out. <laughs> you know, let it let it be expressed. Because mm. if you like oppress that uh, expression, it's just going to come out way more later because of the years of being held back, you know, like the arrow being pulled farther and farther back, you know, it's better to just let it be expressed early. Um, I, I generally kind of let my kid do whatever he wants and I just stay nearby to make sure he doesn't hurt himself. I think that's very good parenting. Um, but yeah, no, I, I love the nostalgia that comes, comes from music. And that for me is also that a, a feeling of like coming home, I think. I've got such, uh, I love like the memories that you can uh, kind of like that click moment, I guess, of like this exact moment right now is where I'm meant to be. I guess with songs, it just takes me back to moments where I felt like that. It's kind of like hmm. a, a port key, I guess, to take me back there, hmm. a little time machine. Hmm. It's funny, you use, use, use the word home hmm. to mean a few things. It, it feels like you have a strong sense of home. Yeah, and I, which which is that's a I didn't even really think about that. So thank you. That's an interesting observation because I think for a long time I and I've even talked about it on this podcast of I think I really struggled to understand feel a sense of home. But I think hmm. um, home to me now is just feeling more and more like myself and allowing myself hmm. to be. Um, and I think yeah, like music is such just that. I don't know, it just takes away barriers. That nostalgia takes you back to that moment you were in. And it's just, I don't know, it cuts the crap away, I guess. There's no like barriers mm. or trying to think of anyone else. It just full body takes me back to those moments where I'm fully in myself in that moment. And I think that's what home mm. to me has become, just wow. being myself. And I feel like music uh -huh. has been a, a ticket to that. And I feel like nostalgia is because that takes you back to a moment where you you were you i guess hmm. cool <laughs> and... I, home to me means no obstacles when i was writing in my journal about mm. um what home means to me and thinking a lot about that because i was thinking of buying a home or thinking of making a home or thinking of what kind of home i wanted just a whole bunch of thoughts around home which we i was meaning very literally not metaphorically i was meaning like with the place i live yeah um to me, I thought like home to me is the place with no obstacles. Mm. So I could be 
in a strange land I've never been before, but if I have a little space that is really easy and comfortable for me that has no obstacles. And by obstacles, I don't mean um, just physical obstacles. It could even be like sound, like a noisy environment is an obstacle to my concentration. Um, bad temperature control, a place that's too hot and I can't cool it down or too cold and I can't heat it up. That's an obstacle to my uh, comfort that I, I can't think straight because I'm shivering or I'm sweating all over my keyboard. Um, that's an obstacle. So to me, a place feels most like home when it has no obstacles. Mm -hmm. I love. It. I've never I, ever heard anyone describe it like that before, <laughs> and I I love it. It's very it's uniquely you, um, and that's yeah. I'm going to be thinking about that one. So home to you is a place or a feeling that there is no obstacles. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um. So on this podcast, a huge theme is positive change. And I believe change always starts as us as individuals. I think kind of indirectly, we've been talking a lot about autonomy really across the podcast. Um, what is your advice for someone who wants to cultivate a positive and more kind of fulfilling mindset? Because... That's something hmm. I think I took for granted. That's like thinking that everyone thinks like me and might find that as their natural default, but not everybody does. You might need to know that it's, you might need proof that it's possible to make change happen. I worry about people that are helpless because They've never made a change happen. We'll use a really simple example. If somebody wants to lose weight, but their mm. whole life, their weight has only ever gone up and up and up and up and up and up. It has never gone down. That person would feel pretty hopeless or find it quite hard to have a positive mindset mm. that they could lose weight because they had no evidence of ever doing it. So same with say, pursuing something you really want and getting it. Same with, um, God, same with like being loved, like really being loved. If you had never felt that before, you might feel that that was impossible. But mm. if you had felt it before, you would know that it was possible. If you had lost even two pounds ever through your own will, then you'd know that it was possible and you could do it again and you could do it more. Uh, if you had ever pursued something that seemed out of reach and achieved it, you would know that it was possible. So I think that's, I think we need a little evidence of, to ourselves to know that it's possible to be in the right mindset, to know that we can do it more. Yeah. So do you think like, it's almost like you need like a personal deposit, you know, kind <laughs> of like when you go to like buy a house or something, right? Like the person, like I, I need a deposit first. I need something there to show me like, this is worth my time. I, I can, I can hmm. trust that I'm going to get something back from this. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> so <laughs> personal deposit. Um, and another theme of this podcast, and I'm interested to know, really interested to know your thoughts on this because you, especially for someone who's traveled so widely, um, is community. And what does community mean to you? And has your personal definition of community changed as you've grown through life? So I don't have a good answer for this one. I don't really think in terms of community. I don't seek it. I don't relish it. Um, I haven't thought about that word very much. To me, it often seems like a bunch of people with an agenda that that will, will want to have uh homeowners association meetings or something like that mm. I, I don't mean like homeowners association but you know, like yeah community often turns into people who thrive on being rule makers and organizers and saying oh we've got a community now all right i'm going to organize this community hello yeah. community let's all do such and such i think i'd rather not be a part of any community all these rules and whatnot i just want to do my thing it's like the, again it's like 
the difference between ideas and ideology. Mm. Um, there's people, and then there's community. And community seems to almost click into this ideology. Well, it's like, hey, we have a community now. Let's follow the rules of the community. Yeah. Here's the terms of engagement for our community, because we've got a community here. I think, Ugh. <laughs> Sounds like an ideology. I think I'm going to step out of that. Um, yeah, I said I had no opinions about that. I guess I do have opinions about that. Well, I, I was going to say too, research. like your answer is a good answer because it's personal to you. So if you know, like a <laughs> community is kind of what you don't want, like what yeah. would you want? What does feel right? Individuals, individuals that I adore. Um, my friends are spread around the world, but even if they were all in one place, um, then I would still just think of them as individuals that I adore and maybe uh, some of us would get together at the same time in the same place and adore even more being together um but it, it would be have to be for me a very loose um collection I wouldn't even probably to use the word community to describe that it would just be a bunch of people I like that are together mm. beautiful uh, Derek, my heart is full. So thank you so much for bringing your time, wisdom and energy to the conversation today. I've genuinely loved connecting with you as individuals, <laughs> not as part of a community. Um, and thank you for bringing your real self and not your AI version of you. <laughs> um, I promise all the, all the questions have been my own, um, not by Meg 2.0 or a Megatron or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I, I know the listeners will take a lot from this episode and I would love for the listeners to be able to follow and support your work further. So how could they do this if they wanted to learn a little bit more about you? Um, how could they look out well, for you? You know what they should do is they should send me an email like you did. <laughs> they should send me a weird Meg introduction email, <laughs> uh, yeah, so anybody listening to this, go uh, be your weird self and go to my website, sive.rs, and email me. Say hello. Introduce yourself. Write the email that you would love to write to Derek Sivers. That would be my only advice there. Um, and lastly, before we say goodbye for now, um, please, could you be kind enough to leave us with a piece of advice that you have received that has stuck with you? I'm sure you've had many, but what is one piece of advice that you would like to leave us with? <laughs> Whatever scares you, go do it. Mm. Because then you won't be scared anymore. That is very, very true. Um, Derek, thank you so much. I genuinely have enjoyed and adored the conversation. Thank you for your warmth. Thank you for your authenticity your entrepreneurial spirit um, and to encourage us to break out of conventions and live life with a hell yeah, I guess, <laughs> if anything of your uh, email response is to go by. And thank you for being my kind of person. Thanks, Meg. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm.